Hello and welcome to this online service for Carrick Fergus Baptist Church. I'm going to pray. I'm going to ask God to bless you as you watch and engage with this service at home. And then afterwards, we're going to sing a great hymn of the church, Amazing Grace. So let's join our hearts together in prayer. Dear Father, we worship you this morning. You are a great and an almighty God. We thank you. We praise you that you're a trying God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And even from our homes this morning, wherever we're watching this service, we can worship you. And so we pray, Lord God, that we wouldn't just be watchers of a service or listeners if we're listening to a CD at home. We pray, Lord God, that we would engage with this service. We would engage with your word. We would listen to it. We would obey it. We would pray the lessons of it into our hearts and our lives. We would engage with the songs. We would worship you and praise you with thankful hearts. And so as a congregation scattered at the moment, we pray, Lord God, that you would bless us. May we have a greater love for you. May our hearts be warmed as we engage with this service. And may you bless us and build up your church for the glory of your name in Carrick Fergus. And we pray all these things in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, our Saviour. Amen. <laughs> Boys and girls, the most recent baby born into our church family is Josiah McDermott. That's E.J. and Dermo's son. And Josiah is actually a name that you'll find in the Bible. We've been working our way through the Old Testament, recently been looking at the kings of Israel. And one of the kings of Israel was called Josiah. And there's something really interesting about him. He was the youngest king of the children of Israel. To find out how old he is, that I'm going to read from 2 Chronicles chapter 34. So you listen up and work out his age, what age he was when he became king, and then what age he was when he stopped being the king. So it says, Josiah was eight years old when he began to reign and he reigned for 31 years in Jerusalem. So what age was he when he became king, shouted out? He was eight. Now he reigned for 31 years. So let's see if you can do the mass. How old was he when he stopped being the king? Well, he would have been 39. Now, a number of weeks ago, when we thought about King Hezekiah, we thought about good kings or bad kings. So what do you think he was? Do you think he was a good king? Or do you think Josiah, this boy king, was a bad king? Well, let's listen to the next verse. And it said, And he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, and walked in the ways of David his father, and did not turn aside to the right hand 
or to the left. Of course, he was a good king. I don't think E.J. and Dermo would name their son after somebody who was a bad king. It said he walked in the ways of his father David. That's King David, one of his ancestors, and did not turn to the right or to the left. He was somebody who obeyed God. Now, lots of the kings that had come before him were not good. They were evil kings who had turned away from God. In fact, they worshipped false gods, gods called Baal, and these are just made up gods, and gods made of wood and stone that people would bow down and worship. What King Josiah did when he took over was he destroyed all these idols, all these false gods, and so they smashed the stones to pieces, they chopped down the ones made of wood, and the temple in Jerusalem where the people had used to worship God hadn't been used for such a long time, and so he ordered that it would start to be repaired. And as the people were fixing up the temple, they were going into different rooms, they came across a book, and they looked at this book that they found and thought, what is this? We haven't seen this book. What, what's this book called? Do you know what it was? It was actually the Bible. <laughs> They'd forgotten what the Bible was because people hadn't used it or read it or followed it for so long. They didn't actually know what it was. Now, it wasn't a whole Bible like we have today because these stories were still being worked through and they hadn't even had the New Testament at the stage. So it was the first five books of the Bible. Do you know what, remember what they're called? So we've got Genesis and Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers and Deuteronomy. These are the books that we call the law, the first five books. And when Josiah discovered these books, well, he wanted to do something with them. Now, what's the best thing to do with the Bibles? The best thing to do with the Bible is it just to hold it, have a good look at it. No, the best thing to do with the Bible is to start to read it, to hear what God wants to say to his people. And so Josiah ordered, because he's a good king, for the people to read the scripture out loud. Do you know what's even better than listening to it? Obeying what it says. I want to read a verse from chapter 34 of 2 Chronicles, and it's verse 31. This is what he did. It says, And the king, that's Josiah, stood in his place and made a covenant before the Lord, that's a special promise with God, to walk after the Lord and to keep his commandments and his testimonies and his statutes with all his heart and with all his soul, to perform the words of the covenant that were written in this book. And so Josiah, this young boy king, made a promise to God that he would walk after the Lord, that he would obey the things that he heard in God's word, and he would do these things. That's a great promise to make. Boys and girls, you might be young. You might be a similar age to Josiah. You might be eight, you might even be younger, or you might be a year or two older. Even at a young age, you can have this desire to obey and follow the Lord. And so I want to encourage you not to ignore the Bible, the way people used to do in the past, not to follow and worship other things, not real gods, but instead make a promise in your heart, like Josiah, that you will listen to his word, you will follow it, you will obey it, and you will live for the living God. Now, that's not always easy to do. So I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to pray that God would help you as you do this. Dear Father, we thank you for these great examples in the Bible. We know there are many examples that we don't want to follow, but we thank you for Josiah, young at age, and yet he was determined to follow the living God. We pray, Lord God, for our children. May they have the same desire to listen to your word, but not just to listen to it, to obey it and to follow you and to make you the Lord and the master of their lives. Help them, we pray, in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. God made the earth and filled it full with seas and trees and animals and then he made a man. But Adam, he was incomplete, so God gave him a helper Eve to carry out his plan. This happy husband and his wife, they showed the world what God is like until they disobeyed. And even though they lost it all, we still see fingerprints of God in everyone he makes. We are the image of the God of all the world. He made us boy. He made us girl. Different pieces of the puzzle joined together perfectly. We 
are just the way God wanted us to be. We're shades of brown, we're short and tall, but God himself designed us all unique. So we could see, he wants each one to play a part, to show the world the Father's heart, to have a family. We are the image of the God of all the world He made us boy He made us girl Different pieces of the puzzle Joined together perfectly We are just the way God wanted us We're going to continue our sermon series in the letter to the Ephesians this morning. Our former associate pastor, Paul Savage, is actually going to share God's word with us in our sermon today. And before Paul shares with us, our youth fellowship leader, Chris Wolfe, is going to read today's passage. Ephesians 5, 22 to 33. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church his body, and is himself its saviour. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendour, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, for no one has ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh, this mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the Church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Well, if you are married, <clears throat> I want to ask you, how strong is your marriage? How would you rate your marriage? Now, perhaps that's a difficult question to answer. I suppose a good test of the strength of your marriage would be if somehow you were forced to stay at home and were not allowed to leave the house for a prolonged period of time. We could call it lockdown. How is your marriage during lockdown? Perhaps you're really enjoying this time. Or perhaps it has exposed a lot of what needs to change in your marriage. But I wonder, do you think often about your marriage? I wonder, do you talk often about your marriage? Questions such as, how are we doing in our marriage? Do you assess? Do you evaluate? Do you highlight areas that need change? There was a Christian reading group that I used to be a part of, and it was made up of, of both men and women of, of all ages. And we simply, we, we met once a month, we read a book, and then, as I say, met up once a month to discuss the book. But one evening, the leader of the group um, suggested that we read The Meaning of Marriage by Tim Keller, which really went down like a lead balloon. One of the older men in the group, he smiled and he said, oh, surely we're past that. 
and that was the end of the conversation. I was both shocked and saddened by this response. But I wonder possibly is that what some of us think about marriage? It's only really something to think about when you are young and in love and dreamy and fanciful. But, but actually, well, once you're married, you're married. And that's it. Well, the Apostle Paul would paint a very different picture. What is marriage? Well, if I asked you to define marriage, what would you say? Well, you might say a marriage is for companionship, for procreation, for sexual fulfilment. These are all true. Certainly, marriage fulfills these purposes. But while this is true, it doesn't quite get to the heart of what marriage is. Paul makes it very clear in the passage which we just read what marriage is. Marriage is a picture, a drama, a parable, if you like, of Christ and the church. It is a visible display of Christ and the church and what that relationship is like. Sometimes we, we may say, yeah, well, ultimately marriage is about Christ. But by saying ultimately, but we're actually saying in reality it's more about something else. No, marriage is a picture, whether good or bad, of Christ and the church. It has always been about this. If you look at verses 31 and 32, we see how Paul grinds his argument from Genesis, from the first marriage. He says, therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I'm saying that it refers to Christ and the church. Paul quotes here from Genesis chapter 2, verse 24. He says that there's a mystery here in marriage that is profound, but it really refers to Christ and the church. Now that is interesting because in Genesis 2, Christ had not come. There was no relationship between Christ and the church as, as we have been thinking about through Ephesians as we know it today. But we turn back to Ephesians 1 and we see that God chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world. We were predestined to be God's children through Jesus Christ. So Jesus Christ had not come, but that, of course, was God's plan. Before the foundation of the world, before Adam and Eve came to be, God's plan was that Jesus Christ would come to earth, he would die to win his people and bring them into this beautiful, eternal marriage-like relationship. So from the very first marriage to every marriage today, each of them acts as a picture of Jesus Christ's relationship with his people. And consistently through the Old Testament, God uses marriage imagery to compare his relationship with his people. Marriage has always been about Jesus Christ and the church. Listen to what Martin Lloyd-Jones says about marriage. How many of us, he asks, have realised that we are always to think of the married state in terms of the doctrine of atonement? Now, I'll say that again. How many of us, he asks, have realised that we are always to think of the married state in terms of the doctrine of atonement? In other words, if you're going to understand what marriage is and its purpose, well, you've got to understand Jesus Christ and his work on the cross. That is where you first go and continue to go to think about marriage. Husband and wife have been given the privilege and responsibility of acting out the relationship between Christ and the 
church. And they have been given different roles within this drama. The husband loves his wife like Christ loves the church. The wife submits to her husband like the church submits to Christ. Now this idea of different roles, it brings us back to Ephesians 4. And there we thought about unity and diversity, or unity in diversity. All God's people are equal, but they have been given different roles within the body of Christ as Christ sees fit. Marriage is one relationship within the body of Christ, and in that relationship there are different roles. The husband lovingly leads, the wife willingly submits. This worked perfectly before the fall. And it was tied up with our very identity as human beings. To be male is to lead, to be female is to submit. Now I emphasise again, this is not superiority and inferiority. Look at God himself. Three persons, unity in diversity. What was the role of Jesus Christ to submit to the Father's will? Was he any less God? No. But Satan attacked these God-given roles. Notice in Genesis chapter 3 verse 1, Satan approached the woman not the man who was the leader. Notice how the man in Genesis chapter 3 verse 6 was there with her but failed to stand up and be the leader. And notice that God said to the woman in Genesis 3 verse 16, your desire shall be against your husband and he shall rule over you. So in other words, because of sin, women will struggle to submit to their husbands. They will want to go against him. And because of sin, men will want to abuse the position of leadership and authority God has given him, perhaps to be domineering, controlling, harsh, neglectful with their wives. The consequences of the fall that husbands and wives rebel against their God-given rules. They even become less male, less female, even less human. But Christ has come. Christ has come reversing the fall and now united to him, we are a new people, we've thought lots about that, we are able to regain our God-given roles of leading and submitting, of becoming more male and more female and even more human. And as we have seen through Ephesians, those who are living in Christ, their lives look very differently to those who are living out of Christ. And so it is when we come to think about marriage. Christian marriage will look very different to non-Christian marriage. So let's turn to this text in Ephesians and see what these different rules look like for husbands and wives. I'm going to begin with husbands, verse 25. Husbands, this is how you are to love your wives. Love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Love your wives with a sacrificial love. Love her with a sacrificial love. Husbands, you sacrifice your needs, your wants, your desires, your pleasures, your comforts and time for her wants, desires, pleasures, comfort. Now there may well be times where both of your desires and so forth coincide, but where and if there are differences, husbands always and quickly give up their needs, comfort, pleasure, desire for their wife's 
needs, comfort, pleasure, desire. Husbands, when you sign up to marriage, you sign up to sacrifice. You sign up to giving yourself up for another. You do not marry a wife for what she will bring to you. You marry a wife for what you will give to her. To look to your wife for only what she will give you is really to make an object of her. She becomes a thing to meet your needs rather than a person to be loved and served. Husbands, love as Christ loved. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. We had nothing to give him, but yet sacrificially and unconditionally, he loved us and he gave to us. Husbands, don't make your love for your wife be dependent on what she does for you, but love her sacrificially and unconditionally because she is your wife. Love your wives with a sacrificial love. Then love your wives with a sanctifying love. Look at verse 25 forward. Verse 25, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish, or holy and blameless. Christ showed his love for the church by leaving heaven, by dying for her, and so sanctifying her, cleansing her, taking away her sin. The sanctifying in verse 26 is to do with what we call our positional sanctification. That is our declared righteousness before God. We are holy and blameless because of Christ. But God's purpose, as we have seen from week one in Ephesians, is that we become holy and blameless. The goal of Christ's work on the cross is that we be presented on the final day as holy and blameless, perfect like Christ. And so that is our goal through life, and that is what we call progressive sanctification. Christ has died for his people that they might become holy and blameless. And this was driven by selfless, sacrificial, other-centered love. Christ set aside the glories, the pleasures, the joys, the comforts of heaven to die for his bride, the church. So there may be a sense on a wedding day that a bride is at her peak. She is at her most beautiful. I have played at quite a few weddings. Uh, one of them I, I played at and the bridal entrance music was, was a Bruno Mars song, Just The Way You Are. And the lyrics say, there's not a thing that I would change, because girl, you're amazing, just the way you are. Now, apart from being far too cliche for me, um, there are huge theological problems with this song. Now, I'm sure the girl who picked this song wasn't thinking that deeply about it. I'm sure she just thought, here's a lovely song I would like to, to use that, but the song acts as a good example for the point I am trying to make. There can be that sense on a wedding day from husband to wife that I have found the perfect person and there is nothing about you that I would want to change. But we are to love our wives as Christ loved the church. Christ's goal Christ's purpose, his desire for his church, his bride, is that they continually change to be holy and blameless like Christ. Husbands, your goal in marriage is to see your wives presented to Christ, holy and blameless, perfected in him. 
on your wedding day. Your wife prepared herself for you. Beautiful, I'm sure. Your goal, your life's work now is to prepare your wife for a greater wedding day, beautifully prepared for Christ, her bridegroom. And with her beauty on that day in the future, you will realise then that her beauty on the first day of your marriage could never, ever compare. And on that day in the future, her beauty will be fixed. Her beauty will no longer need changing. Love her with a sanctifying love. To go back to Genesis again, notice in Genesis 3, Adam stood by and didn't intervene when Eve was tempted and disobeyed. And then notice how God held Adam to account, not Eve. And husbands, we too will be held to account for our wife's sanctification. So we do not stand by paying no attention, taking no interest, making no effort to see our wife change to become more like Christ. If you want your wife to become more like Christ, you will pray with her and for her. You will ask her, how can I pray for you? You will ask her, What are your struggles? What are your fears? What are your current temptations? You will take time to listen to her and you will bring her to the Lord in prayer. And of course, this will always be done in a gentle and understanding way. And you will share God's word with her when you can. Bringing God's word to your wife, it doesn't have to be a 40 minute Bible study every day. I mean, great if you can do that. Bring God's word to her in conversation. You bring God's word to bear, to influence, to give perspective. Perhaps you you simply share something that God has been speaking to you through his word. And remember in all of this, your goal is to see her become more like Christ not more like you, okay? And what I mean by that is there are many things that may annoy you about your wife. There may be things you wish wish were different. Perhaps personality traits, perhaps things in her appearance, perhaps how she does simple everyday tasks differently to how you would do them. Do not crush her by trying to change these things about her. Build her up, encourage her. Through your sacrificial love, show her the beauty of Christ that she may become like Christ. Love her with a sacrificial love. Love her with a sanctifying love. Then love her with a self-love. Now this may sound strange in light of all we have just said, but look at verse 28. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. This is the golden rule as Jesus taught. Love your neighbour as yourself. Your wife is your closest neighbour. Love her as yourself. For no one ever hated his own flesh but nourishes it and cherishes it just as Christ does the church, because we're members of his body. The language here, it is tender and it is caring. Okay, we naturally care for ourselves, physically, emotionally, mentally, spiritually. And the things that we perhaps put in place for ourselves, let's make sure they are put in place for our wives. So, for example, perhaps you feel at times you need to just get out of the house and go for a walk. Be sure your wife gets time to go out and go for a walk. Perhaps you feel you need time to see friends. Be sure your wife has time to see friends. 
Perhaps you feel you need a, a Bible study group. Encourage her to go to a Bible study group and so forth. Now her needs may well be different to yours at times, so it is up to you to ask about those, to work those out and put them in place for her. So husbands, love your wives. The sacrificial love with a sanctifying love and with a self-love. So husbands, go and apply this. Then the wives, verse 22. Verse 22, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is its saviour. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Now, the word submit in the original language, it suggests voluntary, willing submission. And of course it is to your own husband, it's not to every and any man. But wives, as your husband leads you lovingly, you know he would do anything to care for you, to protect you. He would sacrifice anything for you. His greatest desire is that you become more like Christ and, uh, and he strives to gently encourage you in that. He's always striving to build you up. Surely a wife would gladly and willingly, with joy, Follow this leader. Submit to his authority, to her own husband. Surely she would respect a man like this. See, to submit slavishly or begrudgingly, it doesn't show respect. You gladly submit to one who is enabling you to thrive as a wife, as a female. As a human, your husband's leadership is freeing you to be who you are meant to be. To submit to him, it isn't some sort of entrapment, it is freedom. Wives, do your husbands know that you respect them? The more they know this, the more they will be free to be who they are meant to be. Strong, loving, male leaders. So the wife models the church, who, of course, willingly, gladly submits to Jesus Christ in response to his sacrificial love. The wife submits as to the Lord. Her willingness to respect and follow her husband's lead is part of how she submits to the Lord. Her submission to her husband shows her submission to the Lord. Now it may be helpful here just to point out what submission is not. Submission does not mean Wives, you no longer have any choice. You no longer have any thinking of your own. Okay, if, you're, if your husband is looking to your needs and interests, he's going to want to know what your thinking is. He's going to want to consult you in making decisions. Submission does not mean you're no longer able to influence or challenge your husband. Okay, remember, you're both believers in the Lord. You're both accountable to each other for each other's spiritual growth. Submission does not mean that there are no other people and means aside from your husband of helping you to grow spiritually. Okay, hopefully all that we've studied so far in Ephesians would tell us that. We need everyone within the local church. But submission does mean that you affirm and respect your husband's position of leadership within the home, recognising that has been appointed by God. What we see, marriage is all about 
Jesus Christ. You see, marriages do not work in the way described. When roles within marriage are abused, even when there's a complete breakdown in the marriage relationship, there is much at stake. I mean, families may never fully recover the consequences of an unhealthy marriage or a broken marriage, even to the next generation. That is devastating. But there is a much higher stake in marriage. And that is the name and the glory of Jesus Christ. When husbands do not love their wives as they should, they diminish and they cheapen the love of Christ. When husbands are not prepared to sacrifice for their wives, they belittle the sacrifice of Christ. And when wives do not willingly submit to their husbands, they're saying it's not worth submitting to and following Jesus Christ. And when marriages break down, that says there's no lasting or permanent security in Jesus Christ. So yes, marriage is serious. It is not to be entered upon lightly, but with due consideration. The vows you make are indeed solemn vows. If you're in a relationship and perhaps you're considering marriage, you need to think very seriously about this. There is much at stake. What are you looking for in a spouse? Firstly, men, do you know what you are called to? And are you looking for a wife who will gladly submit to you and affirm you as her leader? Women, are you looking for a man whose greatest desire is to see you become more like Christ? I mean, forget, forget thinking about age gaps, forget job prospects, forget appearance. If you want a biblical marriage, these are the key questions you need to consider. For those who are married, perhaps a few years, perhaps 10, 20, 30, even 40 plus years, may we continue, as Lloyd-Jones says, to understand the atonement and its effects. To understand Jesus Christ's work on the cross and its effects for God's people. And may we never tire of passionately picturing and displaying that in our marriages. Now, as I said earlier, the marriage relationship is, is just one relationship within the body of believers. A marriage is not exclusively for that man and woman, the husband or wife. Do you know that there's actually something quite nice about lockdown? Of course, not the reasons that brought it about, but there's something nice about getting locked away with your own wee family. There's something comforting about that. But it's not the way it's meant to be, because marriage is for the local church. Marriage, like all other relationships, is for the building up of the local church, that we may all mature in Christ. Remember Paul prayed in chapter 3 that God's Spirit would strengthen us to understand the love of Christ. Well, God has given us each of us within the local church, a physical picture of this love. Each of us should be able to look at marriages within the local church and be able to understand better how Christ has loved us. We should be able to look at husbands and how they love their wives and be blown away that Christ has loved me so sacrificially, so unconditionally, so 
tenderly. We should be able to look at wives and understand better what it means for me to submit to Jesus Christ. Now, for this to be effective, we need to really get to know marriages. We need to be able to get to know husbands and wives and them working together. And I think for that to happen, we, need to, we really need to see each other beyond Sundays. Now, of course, this is not visible at the minute. But I think we need to be able to see each other in, in, in our homes. We need to share hospitality. Married couples. Be sure you don't just invite other married couples into your home. Invite single people, invite people of all ages, that they might be built up in their faith. That you can show fellow believers how Christ loves his people and how they are to respond to that. Single people don't feel uncomfortable about going into family situations. See the opportunity to learn more of the love of Christ and be built up in your own faith. A united marriage builds up the local church. And here we must note that disunity in marriage is disunity in the local church. Okay, the health of your marriage affects the health of the local church. So marriage is not exclusive. Your marriage is for the building up of the local church. And finally, your marriage is for the saving of the lost. People around you who do not know Christ, they too need to get to know your marriage well. Allow people to get to know you. Perhaps people in Craigavon, perhaps neighbours that do not know Christ. Have those people in your home. Show them hospitality. Husbands, by how you love your wife, allow them to see the magnificent love of Christ. Wives, how you love your husbands, allow them to see how good it is to follow and submit to Jesus Christ. And may people be drawn to Jesus because of your marriage. So husbands, love your wives. Wives, submit to your husbands. That the gospel might be clearly seen. That the church might be built up. And that the lost would come to Jesus Jesus will be glorified. Amen. And let us pray. Our Father and God, we do indeed want to glorify Jesus Christ. We want to thank you for marriage within the local church. And Father, we are aware of this huge responsibility that it is to be within a marriage. And Father, we come to you and we want to ask your forgiveness when we have made marriage more about me than about Jesus Christ. Father, as husbands, we are sorry the times that we have not loved our wives as we should, and in that we have diminished Christ's love. The times we have not sacrificed for our wives, and in so doing we have belittled the sacrifice of Christ. And as wives, may they too repent for the times that they have not willingly and gladly submitted to their husbands. Father, for those of us who are in marriage, we ask for your Holy Spirit to help us. 
as husbands, help us to love our wives as Christ loved the church. We recognize that day and daily, this is a spiritual battle and we need your Holy Spirit to strengthen us from within. Father Mary, we have honest, gentle conversations. Father, may your spirit to strengthen and enable wives to submit to sacrificial, sanctifying love. Father, give us a passion for marriage. Help us to see it for what it really is. And Father, for those in our local church who are not married, may they have a very high view of marriage. May they be committed to pray for the marriages in our local fellowship. May they be able to look at the marriages in our church and catch something of the love of Christ for them. To learn something of how they are to submit to Jesus. Father, may we all be thankful for our union, that marriage to Christ. We thank you that where we have failed, Christ is perfect. Father, fill us with hope and anticipation as we move towards that great wedding day where we will see Christ face to face. Give us determination to strive in preparation for that day. And we thank you that on that day we will not need any more change. We will be perfected in him and forever glorify him. Father, we give you thanks. Would you glorify your son? And we pray in his name. Amen. Oh